Hi teachers, today we're gonna to talk about basic ornamentation in piano teaching. So we're going to cover the mordant, the trill, the turn, and the appoggiatura, which is not to be confused with its modern day counterpart, the grace note. We're going to look at all four of these um, a little bit in depth, but I first want to start off by saying this is not a musicological dissertation. I am not a musicologist. I'm not even an early keyboards expert. I am simply a piano teacher who enjoys early music and I like doing things right. And I've noticed that a lot of teachers have a lot of confusion around ornamentation in teaching their students intermediate and early advanced repertoire. I just wanna say also there's no shame in this confusion. Many people who graduate with a college degree in music are not given specifically early music um, training around things like early keyboards or ornamentation. And there's a lot of people who have questions about this. So if you have questions about this, you're in good company. But I do wanna say now, since I'm gonna help you with this in the next 10 minutes, um, and since there are so many resources available to us to understand this topic, that it's now time for you to choose not to be confused. One of my piano teacher friends used that phrase with me, choose not to be confused about this. This video is intended to be simply an introduction for you and a jumping off point. And I'll have some resources at the end if you want to do further research. I'm just touching the tip of the iceberg and I'm hopeful that the things that we talk about here you can use in your teaching in the next week or the next month. Okay, so let's go back to our ornaments. First, we're gonna talk about the mordant. The mordant looks like a trill, but has a vertical slash through it. Uh, mordants are very popular in Baroque music and they're probably the easiest ornament to execute. When you see a mordant, you start on the note that is printed on the staff. So if it's a G, you play G first, you go down either a half step or a whole step and come right back to the note. So again, if I were on G, I could either play G F sharp G or G F G. And the decision between the half step and the whole step is entirely based on the context of the piece, what key you're in, um, what has come right before that, and that's a matter of taste. And sometimes I even go and listen to recordings to hear what somebody did, but I really just kind of generally think if there's an F sharp in that measure, I'm probably gonna use F sharp there. Again, that's partly a matter of taste, which you're gonna hear me say many times, because in general, ornamentation is a matter of taste after these general guidelines. Okay, so that's the mordant, that's how you play it. If your mordant is listed or printed on the note um, D, then you start it on D, go down to C or C sharp, and back to D. I'm gonna have some examples of these later, but let's now move on to our next ornament, which is a standard trill. Uh, trills look like this. They might be longer in their number of wiggles, or they are oftentimes also notated with just the letters T, R. I'm sure you've seen these many, many times. Trills are one of the ones that change over the course of time. In the Baroque era and in most of the classical era, performers start the trill on the note above the printed note. So if your printed note is G, then you're going to start on A. And for that type of trill that I showed you, you can do anything from what I tell my students, two wiggles, to many, many wiggles across an entire measure if it's a long note. But generally it should sound something like this. If it were printed on D, I would start on E and again, play two wiggles. Or I can make a longer trill like that. The principal note, the one that's printed, is being ornamented with the one above. Sometimes in music you see a little two little tiny 16th notes at the end um, to get you out of the trill, or even shorter than that. Um, and that again is a matter of taste and sometimes composers print that and sometimes they don't. I will say once we hit 
Beethoven, mid, middle Beethoven or so, and the years beyond him, the Romantic era, generally you're going to start trills on the principal note, on the printed note on the page. Again, that is a big generalization. And many people make cases for trills in the classical era and sometimes even the Baroque era, starting on the principal note based on what came before the note with the trill. So again, those are the kinds of things that are a matter of taste. But as a general rule, your starting point should be start on the note above. Okay, our next ornament is the turn. And the turn does exactly what it looks like. The principal note is in the middle and you go above that note and come below it and then end on the principal note. So if I have a turn on D, I might do this. I started on E, went to D, went underneath it and came back. Sometimes you see turns in the middle of say a dotted eighth, 16th note and it might have that D first. So you play the D, then you turn around it and go like that. So if on, printed on the page, it might be D, E, F sharp, and I play. And for students who struggle with fitting that in the rhythm, I frequently tell them that the, the turn itself is a triplet on the second 16th note. So if you're thinking one, E, and a two or whatever the equivalent is to that. I'm just giving you a general example, but that helps students, especially if they have something like 16th notes in the left hand. That happens really frequently in sonatinas and similar um, music like that. Okay, our last ornament is the appoggiatura, and I believe this is the one that is the most widely misunderstood. An appoggiatura looks like a modern grace note, but it does not have a slash through it. So just to compare that with the other one that I drew here, this is a grace note. It has a slash through it. And most Baroque and classical appoggiaturas look like this or coming up from the note underneath. Um, either way, it's still an appoggiatura, but it looks like this. And most of them, not all, but most of them indicate the note value that you are supposed to play. So this note happens on the beat and then you play this one after the beat. So for instance, if this is D, C, I would play eighth note D on the beat followed by eighth note C to make up that one quarter note value. And I'm gonna give you an example of this in a minute. Sometimes, very occasionally, the note values do not line up in a helpful way like that, but just know that that's, um, that's how it's supposed to be or how it's frequently printed, I should say. Okay, you oftentimes see these with 16th notes where the rhythm will be an eighth note followed by two 16th notes and there's an additional 16th note appoggiatura before the eighth note. The best example of this is in Mozart's Rondo, Rondo alla Turca, we have the very beginning, the B to the A. And that's written as an appoggiatura B going to eighth note A and then 16th notes. That should go on the beat. Um, the B is the first note on that beat. And people often say, well, then why is it written like that? Why was it not written like four 16th notes? I think the best answer for this is that the whole idea of an appoggiatura is leaning on a note that is not in the harmony. So right here we're, we're in A minor, so if I add a chord to that, the B is the non-harmonic tone and it's really juicy until you resolve it to the A. And that's what most appoggiaturas are. You have some harmony that the principal note is the resolution of, and the appoggiatura leans into a dissonance and then has such a beautiful and satisfying resolution after it. All right, so I'm gonna give you a few quick examples of this. If we go back to our mordant, my favorite way to introduce this to students is in the little prelude in C major by Johann Sebastian Bach. This is BWV 939. 
And I'll put um, these pieces in IMSLP links in the description of the video so you can easily click it and see what I'm talking about. But the left hand in measure 9, 10, and 11, the principal notes are just a bouncing G chord note octave. And each of the top G's has a little mordant on it. So because, even though this is a prelude in C and the key signature has no sharps, we have modulated as of measure 8 into G major and there are F sharps present. So I do play this with an F sharp as part of that mordant. And it's also important to note that that goes on the beat. So it lines up, the first G lines up with the right hand. but it's really fun to play once they get it. So I strongly recommend that piece. It's one of my favorites for uh, moving out of Anna Magdalena Bach into some of his harder uh, little preludes and um, inventions, that kind of level of piece. My second example comes from the very famous Minuet in G. And I'm looking at this in my Henley Urtext. And if you look at an Urtext edition of this, there are ornaments in it. Many student editions do not include these ornaments or don't include all of them. Um, and even if I have my student look at the Urtex, they don't have to play all the ornaments. Remember, ornaments are a matter of taste. And so it's all right to omit some of them or even to add your own if you know how to do so. So in measure three, my right hand has a mordant on the note C. And then I have another one in measure five on the downbeat. My favorite one, in measure eight, I have an appoggiatura. It's printed as an eighth note, uh, little teeny weeny eighth note B, and then the big dotted half note A. So that should sound like one and two and three and. That B should be the eighth note on the beat going to A on one and. So if I play all that together with the left hand, it should sound like this, starting in measure three. One more trill marked in my edition on measure 30, and that's just a standard trill with no vertical line to indicate that it's a mordant, and that's on the B in measure 30, and I would play that like this. A similar trill to that happens in the Bach invention number one in C major. A video on that piece so I would encourage you to watch that and I do talk about the ornaments that I use in there and how I execute them. My last practical example today is from a Haydn sonata. I am teaching this one. This is the sonata in G major. It's number 27 and um, it, this is a really fun first sonata, bigger sonata for a student and right at the very beginning we get that classic dotted eighth note 16th combination with a turn. So if I played it without the turn, the right hand would sound like this. One and two and one E and a two E and a one and two. If I add the turns, I'm gonna put them on that second 16th note, as I said, and they go by very, very fast. So your, your students have to be able to get this in a quick movement. And that's not even up to tempo. You might wanna play the piece more like this. And then right there in measure three, there's an appoggiatura on that top A, which should be executed as four sixteenth notes, as I just did. Uh, when you get down to measure seven, there's a standard trill with the little ending part. So this, this is measure six. Appoggiaturas throughout this piece. One more example would be uh, in the second theme, if I start the pick up to measure 25, I have an appoggiatura G in measure 25, which is four sixteenth notes, 
And then the downbeat of 26 has an eighth note appoggiatura. So those are gonna be the same idea, but with a slightly different rhythm. So here's what that sounds like. All right, so I hope that gives you a few ideas and specific examples on different ways to teach this type of ornamentation. This is specifically Baroque and early classical. Most of these rules continue to apply with the exception of, as I said, in the Romantic era and even later Beethoven, even mid-Beethoven, we tend to start the standard trill on the principal note as opposed to starting it on the note above. But I would encourage you to do your own research on exactly when that shifts over and then again, use your ear. It's all a matter of taste in the specific example at hand. If you'd like to look at this more uh, and know more about this and get a far more scholarly approach than what I was able to give you in 10 minutes, I would strongly um, recommend that you purchase the Willard Palmer editions of any Bach pieces that you are teaching. He has a lovely edition of the Bach Inventions that has a long explanation of ornamentation at the beginning. Similarly, Maurice Hinson's editions usually do the same thing and uh, that's what I'm looking at here for my Haydn. And this book is no exception. He has a very long, detailed, wonderful introduction at the beginning that can help you execute these, as well as he gives little footnotes um, on how to do some of the specific ornaments found within the pieces. And then lastly, if you want to buy a book specifically about ornamentation to do your own research on this, um, this is the most helpful, clear to read, um, written for the everyday piano teacher book that I know of, kind of all in one about ornamentation. So it's called Ornamentation, a question and answer manual. And they go through every time period, every piece of notation, lots of exceptions. And then they even have, um, one of the best parts is they say, okay, I'm doing this. I have a procedure and a, a checklist for what era am I in? Who is the composer? What type of ornament is it? And then kind of walks you through, given all those questions, how you're going to do this or what your possible choices are. They also have a very long bibliography at the end, so there's even more resources at your fingertips there if you'd like to look at them. I hope this was helpful in some way. I hope I could help you clear up some basic confusion. If you have more questions about teaching, especially intermediate repertoire um, from the Baroque or classical eras, please go to my website and check out my teacher consultation service. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel and I wish you all the best in your teaching.